Hello there, this is a video of me redoing a talk I gave at the PHP South Africa 2018 uh, conference in Johannesburg. Um, and I decided to do this to post on YouTube in case anybody else would be interested in the content. So with all of that being said, let's get on with it. So first of all, my name is Gareth McComsky. I'm a senior developer at Runway Cell in Cape Town in South Africa. And if anybody's interested in following a relatively quiet Twitter account, well, there's my handle there, so feel free to do that. Moving on, first of all, let's just take a look at what it is that we are going to be talking about, just so everyone knows what to expect from the talk. First of all, this is not a, um, an in-depth expert talk into the topics of security and event sourcing. This is very much an introduction into these design patterns. Um, so if you've heard of the, heard the terms and are curious about them, this is the talk for you. It's also more specifically relates to how security and event sourcing operates in the realm of microservices. So if you're also looking for it, you know, as far as it relates to your own monolith with your in your classes and 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 objects and so on, well, this is this is going to be a bit uh, broader than that into the microservices realm. So it might not be totally applicable, but at least the principles will be very similar. So to start off with, they're going to, we're going to go through a quick just intro into what microservices are, just to understand and have a baseline understanding of, of what it is we're talking about. Then we're going to go on to the problems that you experience with data management between your microservices and the general problems of communication between these services as well. And finally, how uh, event sourcing and CQRS can come in to help solve these, these very specific problems uh, when building microservices. Cool, so moving on, uh, what are microservices? So first of all, we have to just put it out there. Microservices are a thing. Um, they're busy, uh, it's, it's a new sort of architectural pattern that is busy encroaching into our world as web developers. So this is not something we can ignore. And there's some very good reasons why uh, big companies like Netflix and Uber um, and many, many, many others are finding it so appealing. So first of all, to bear in mind, microservices isn't something that is gonna be a direct uh, improvement in the app that you're building for your customers. Microservices is a quality of life improvement for us as developers. And the reason for that is because as 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 apps become bigger and bigger and bigger for us to build, um, they become a lot more difficult to, uh, the context of these big apps become difficult to maintain sort of in our uh, minds, in our heads as we're building things. So to be able to break these massive monoliths up into smaller pieces that you can take one piece and be responsible for it and be con and be constantly aware of the context you're in when you're working in that specific service is incredibly helpful as a developer. Um, it also makes it less opaque uh, coming in, uh, for example, as a new developer, if you just come in and you work on a single microservice with a very limited scope, you can very quickly get into how this microservice operates versus the entire rest of the stack. It also, uh, it's a bit debatable um, in some areas, but in general, unit testing becomes a lot easier with microservices. As your uh, single uh, application becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes more difficult to, to reach you know, your, your unit test coverage that you would like. Um, but building things as microservices, it becomes much easier to quickly build unit tests in a smaller microservice. Um, the testing issue is more difficult for things like integration tests because of your several, you have several scattered microservices that are separated. So that does become a little bit trickier, um, but in general, unit testing, which is very important, is much, much easier to accomplish. And in general, um, microservices, if done correctly, of course, um, and especially looking in um, in the way we are with, with event sourcing and CQRS, um, can actually enforce uh, good coding practices on an architectural level. So instead of forcing, uh, trying to get developers to build good apps on the object and module level, as you would in a monolith, you're taking them one level up, the st one level out of that, and forcing good coding practices onto them through the architecture itself. All right, so just some attributes of microservices, so we can get to the, so we can understand the problems I was talking about before. One of the attributes is uh, size, and I put this in quotes because size is a bit of a contentious topic uh, when it comes to talking about microservices, and no one's got a real definitive guideline as to what we mean by the size of a microservice. In general, you can you can apply uh, domain-driven design principles on this. Um, so looking at a, a specific uh, business domain is a great way to break up your microservices and is a good starting point. Often when your your application starts getting even bigger, you end up breaking down your domain microservices to even smaller services, but it's a good starting point to look at that. And we're going to be having an example of that kind of thing later on. Also, 
um, in the microservices world is kind of best practice is considered uh, it's considered best practice to have each service manage its own data source um, and by that I mean that you have a database per service that is not shared between your microservices so joins between services is discouraged um, and, and I mean, should have guess put joins in in quotes as well because what I mean by joins is that you don't want to have web service requests to resolve your foreign keys between the disparate uh, databases between your microservices now. With that, that means that synchronous communications in general is discouraged and asynchronous communications is where you want to try and push the envelope for communicating between your services. Um, Further microservice attributes to, con to consider in this is that replication of data across services is, is how you go ahead and accomplish not having to continuously perform synchronous uh, communications between your services. And this sounds like a very scary idea because if you've been a web, de web, de web developer for any time, your uh, the idea of normalization would have been drilled into you from day one that you know your your database your your data structure should be normalized your foreign key should you know be what you use to join your data together to get the relationships down um, but really it's not it doesn't sound as scary as, as, as it might it's actually a very in, very interesting and very pragmatic way to solve this problem so bearing in mind that relational um, databases essentially came about during the days when when disk space was incredibly expensive um, which it isn't anymore. So the idea of, of denormalizing, you're basically swapping uh, CPU expense, which is more expensive now, which is what you use to do, to do your joins, uh, for disk expense. So you're essentially replicating data out and it, it's costing a bit more disk, but so what? These days, disk is, is very, very cheap to use. All right. So you kind of hinted at this problem of communication with synchronous and asynchronous and data replication, but let's explore this. Just a little bit more so we can completely understand where the issues lie. So we're going to do this through an example. And the example I'm going to have is a bit of a contrived um, microservices ecosystem, starting with a basic customer service that essentially handles the CRUD for customer data. Uh, create, read, update, and delete of customer data. Very simple, nothing complicated. Same with the product service. So we have now two services, one that handles customer data, one that handles product data. And here you can see... What I was talking about domains in our company, our company has customers, our company has products, but our company also has orders. So this is where we have an orders service as well now. So th this is a very basic example of three basic services that we have in our company, where we have customers, products, and orders. And orders is basically a combination of products and customers because customers have ordered something. So let's look at how we would have mapped this, uh, this system out traditionally in a relational database um, with a customer table, first of all. Some very basic fields here, ID, first name, last name, shipping address, and credit card token. And by that I mean just you've, you've sent credit card details to a payment provider and they've given you a token that you can use to re, redo transactions without having to store actual credit card information. Then we have our products table, which also contains just some basic product information. And we have our orders table. And here you can see already we have a customer ID that links to the ID of the customer table. This is just very convenient. This is how we do things. Now because we could have many products in a single order and we could and, and a single product could be on many orders. That's a many to many relationship. So we would have a join table, an order products table that will sit essentially between these two to map the combination of orders and products. Very normal, nothing special here. But remember we said that in microservices, we need to have each service have its own data source individually. So let's take that out and map them as they would as services. So just a naive, uh, implementation. So let's consider we have a customer service and it has a customer table inside holding that customer information. There's kind of no problem with that so far. We also have a product service which kind of does the same thing with the products table. And now we have an order service and this is where we start seeing where these potential issues might be because now we have our orders table which <clears throat> might be okay except it has a customer ID column in it which refers to an ID in the other service on the customer service. But we you know, and we also have the product ID, so in the orders products table. So now this or uh, I, the, the product ID in the orders products table is pointing at the product service. So without any further information, we would take, we would maybe naively think the idea of taking a HTTP request from the orders service to the customer service. And if we need to get the customer details for an order, we just go and query the customer service. It seems reasonable. 
we could we might consider to do the same for the product service make just a regular http web service request unfortunately this can cause us a lot of potential issues the issues being that this uh, these are synchronous uh, requests so the uh, if we have a query come into the order service to get the detail of a specific order and we want to populate the customer data and the products data from the relations on these on the customer service and the product service this gives us a problem uh, because we'd have to make a query, a synchronous query to the customer service, wait for a response, wait for it to finish what it's doing, and network can take some time. Once that's completed, we then have to make a query to the product service. Maybe we make multiple queries because we have multiple product IDs. Maybe we have a bulk query, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that we have two synchronous HTTP network requests going out from the order service before we can return a response. Now imagine if our system was more complex. Imagine if we had 50 services and maybe the order service had to go to five or six different services. Now things can seem to start taking a very, very long time if you have to queue five separate network requests just to complete a single request to the order service. So this isn't necessarily ideal anymore. Now we have a serious problem to resolve. And if you're wondering, yes, this, this I actually have experience. I have actually built a system this way as an experiment to see how bad it can actually be. And this was only in a system of about five uh, services where we started really um, getting hitting some major bottlenecks in our ability to uh, fulfill queries on the service. So let's rethink this. Let's look at this in a different way. So let's look more deeply into the orders service here and see how we can go and optimize this because this is really the service that has the problem. So let's look, we have an orders table, all right? We have the uh, customer ID table, our uh, customer ID uh, record that we need to store. So instead of us having to um, essentially uh, fulfill this foreign key relationship with an HTTP request, we just create a customer table inside the order service itself. So now if we have to complete the foreign key uh, relationship, it is a, a local um, join. It's no longer joining across an HTTP network boundary to a different service. Now that solves a problem. Uh, we can now immediately create a local customer table for that information. We can do exactly the same thing by storing a products table within the order service itself instead of having to query outside over the network. And again, because we know everything's local, we can continue to have the orders products table, the product ID, order ID, and customer ID here, all reference local entities. And no longer go over the network. That's an improvement. Now the next question comes along, how do we make sure that we keep the customer and products table data synchronized correctly with the customer and product service? So this is where CQRS and event sourcing come in, finally, to help us solve these kinds of problems. So let's just quickly go through an understanding of what event sourcing, uh, event sourcing is. And event sourcing and CQRS is a realm of many, much terminology and many uh bits and pieces to understand like i said this is an intro course and there isn't really much scope here to go into a massive deep dive so i'm just going to go through some basics of exactly what event sourcing is and the idea with event sourcing is it's it's about creating a table of events that are performed on an entity so that sounds quite abstract we are going to go through an example the entity for an entity for example is like it is like an example before an entity entity could be a customer a product or an order and now traditionally what we would do if we wanted to change uh, the state of an entity, if we want to update a specific customer in our customer table, we would send an update request to our customer table to change that data. That is what we would do to reflect this new state. But we end up, what, we, what happens when we do that is we lose any historical record of that entity. So for example, if, um, if I uh, change the surname of a customer, we don't know what their surname used to be. So we might not be able to link them to other events that they may have been involved with in the past with other uh, uh, surname details. Uh, if we, for example, change their shipping date, the example, the example that I have given at the conference is imagine we have an order that has a specific customer place the order. They have a specific shipping date and they place the order on that shipping date and there's a customer ID reference. Now, we, uh, and the order gets placed, it gets fulfilled, it's done, you know, the order's been fulfilled. We don't need to worry about it anymore. But two months later, the customer calls in and, 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 and requests a shipping uh, address change. So we change the shipping address on the customer record in the customer table. The problem with that is, is that maybe a week later, someone from sales decides they want to get a report of sales two months ago in that region that the customer used to live in. 
And that customer's data should be reflected in this salesperson's report. But we have since changed that customer's shipping uh, address. So we, he'll no longer be part of that report. And the report for the salesperson will be inaccurate. It'll show less sales in that area than there really should be. So that's just an example of one way that, you know, data can be lost. And this happens all over the place. So event sourcing helps us in creating an immutable event log of all of our changes that we can just go back to uh, in history and, and replay all these events and, 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 and to any point in time and see what, our, what the state of all our entities were at a specific point in time. As a simple example of this, if, if, if you ever run a, a master-slave uh, a master, MySQL setup, the bin log between the master and the slave is an ex a very simple example of a, an event sourcing type system. The master will write the events that are performed on the master into a bin log that the slave then replays. And this is here's an example of what I'm talking about. Let's create, let's have a uh, an event log um, of our customer's data. So this is what you can see here is essentially a log of the sequence of events of a of changes to a just one specific entity. So for example, I can see um, just imagine we have a a post request has come in to add a customer to our database and we then in our event log we have a table specifically for logging events and we log we have an event called create and the data that we're adding is Gareth McComsky and so you can see here this is named I'm named incorrectly just like my high school one of my high school teachers used to call me and the ID for my for this new entity that we've created is entity one is ID one now uh, maybe half an hour later, I realize, oops, my surname is spelled incorrectly. So I send a put request to update my details. And the event log doesn't change this first record. It adds, it appends a new uh, event log on. Remember, this is immutable. I cannot change this now that it's in. So instead, I create a new event type. I call it update. I give it the data that's being updated and the entity I'm, I'm going to be updating onto. Great. Now I've got an updated version of uh, my details stored in this event log and then maybe a week later or whatever it is I decide now nah, I don't want to be in this database anymore I'm going to send a delete request to the API and it's going to add an event type of delete onto this uh, event log with the uh, entity that needs to be deleted so what you have here is you've, if you want to look at the actual custom what they call an aggregate now if you want to look at the customer aggregate the current state of customers in our database if you want to find entity one I would no longer be in there because I would have been created, I would have been updated and then deleted. So the sum of all my events is the result that I'm no longer in the, in the database. But you do still have a record of me. And this is one of those things I was talking about. The data of, of, of Gareth McComsky has not been lost. It doesn't need to be in the main aggregate customer table that contains the current state of customers, but it is in the event log. So I'll, uh, my, my information has never been lost. And that's the basic idea of event sourcing here is that we are logging these events one by one. We are not constantly changing the state of a single entity in a table. We are logging these events in sequence and we may have a table that contains the current state called an aggregate, but the main source is this event log here. So let's take a look at the customer service as a way to do this with an event log. So here we have our customer event table with the ID, the event type, the data, the entity ID, and maybe we put a create to that so we can keep a log of when these were created. We also have our custom entity table, our aggregate, which is the, the, the uh, current state of all users in our system at, uh, at the current time. And that's what I was talking about. The, you, you, take the, you, you, you play all the events of the event table to create an aggregate in the customer entity table. Relatively simple, not too complicated. So CQRS is essentially um, a combination is com usually combined with event sourcing because they, they do work very closely together, uh, do work very well together. Um, because uh, first of all, command uh, CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation, and a lot of the structure of event sourcing maps quite nicely over to CQRS. First of all. The CQRS uh, essentially states that you should have only one data source that receives all of your writes, they're known as commands, your updates, your creates, and your deletes. Um, and that source is always responsible for changing of state. You don't want to do anything else but do state changes at this uh, one specific uh, source. Uh, subsequently, any queries then go to, go to an alternate read-only source uh, where you do no uh, state changes. So. Um, 
the command for uh, the C for command for your uh, inserts, updates, and deletes, and the Q for all your queries for your read-only data. But wait, this is kind of familiar already because we've just looked at the customer service where we had an event table which we write only to, and a query, uh, a customer entity table where we can run queries from. And the CQRS, these are generally called uh, pro uh, projections where you project your writes onto a read-only uh, source. Um, but it's essentially this, uh, very similar to the event sourcing model we saw previously, except CQRS just makes it more distinct. Um, if you look at CQRS on the level of, uh, on the object level, um, instead of on a uh, more macroscopic microservice level, um, you have, have specific objects meant for uh, uh, retrieving and querying that database and very specific um, uh, modules and so on for uh, doing all your writes. So it does, there is a more distinct relationship in keeping writes and reads separate. And event sourcing does really help give us that kind of structure. So it's very useful to us. And looking again, if we um, have, if we need to map events on our customer table to uh, aggregates or, or, or entity tables on the other side, we need somewhere in between to help us bridge the gap and, and send this data across. So once we put that create event into our event table, we need to find a way to get that message across to our entity table, our aggregate, our projection on the other side. And the way to do this is with, with, with various options when it comes to asynchronous communication mediums. Now, why would we want to do this? Because why are we going to add something in the middle here? Why can't we just have the event table talk directly to our customer entity table? The real problem is, is that a lot of the time there's more than one uh, uh, a projection or aggregate on the other side that is affected by changes in the customer event table, um, which we're going to look at now. So the asynchronous communication is just fill in the gap in this layer here and help us add an extra layer of reliability and so on to our, um, our aggregates. So let's just take a look a bit more detail in the asynchronous communication side of things and how this can help us. So like I was saying, it acts as a reliability layer for us. And this uh, also adds as a replication layer so that it can help us communicate to multiple projections and aggregates that we may have. It can sit between these services, um, but the great advantage that they have is because they are so low latency, they help reduce the uh, latency involved in, in managing these replication events that we need across all our services. So they're very good at very quickly ingesting data um, and then and at that point um, it can then tell the uh, client service that's sending the data thank you very much carry on with your life do what you need to do i'll take this from you and go do what i need to it just helps speed up the writes on our system essentially this also adds the ability for us to retry so imagine if um, you know the the event table receives an event to log it sends that it then tries to write to a projection which is down now what does it do it doesn't specialize in, able, in being able to communicate effectively to downed services, whereas this in-between uh, asynchronous communications layer can do that for us. It, it has these capabilities already built in. Um, so one example of an asynchronous, asynchronous communications layer is a pub sub tool. Uh, things like SNS, for example, in Amazon's uh, cloud is a very good example of that. Um, and they normally very, they're very good at being able to be easily consumed across multiple services. The next step up from that, if you're looking for something that can handle uh, volume a bit, a bit more uh, cleanly and efficiently, is uh, considering options like message queues, uh, things like SQS, uh, RabbitMQ type systems, um, where you can batch messages together. The downside of this is that they're generally not great at, um, I just noticed the typo now, um, they're generally not so great at splitting out messages to multiple uh, recipients. Um, so you may have to have some kind of orchestration portion on the other side of the message queue that can do that for you, uh, but these do tend to handle volume a, a bit better. And then one step further from that is if you look at stream uh, communication options such as uh, Kinesis streams, uh, these these can uh, are, are generally better at handling large volumes of incoming data and holding on to them for longer periods of time for retries and, and so on in, in case of uh, down services. So you've got some good options to look at here. All right. So now let's take a step back and consider the, um, the synchronization of customer data across um, from the customer service to the order service. 
So let's look at the customer service again. We should we should have uh, expect to have our customer event table now and a projection of the current state of customers in our customer service, just like we we're looking at with the event sourcing side of things. We were talking about that. Our customer events will will cause an, a projection of the current state of all our customers in the customer service. Shouldn't be too crazy now. Now we also have our order service, which should also have a projection of the current state of customers in uh, the order service. But one thing I don't think I mentioned previously is to bear in mind is that this version of the customer's uh, table can be and usually is very different from the customer's uh, projection in another service because the order service doesn't necessarily need all the data that exists for uh, a customer in order to fulfill an order. For example, we had the customer table had the uh, credit card token. The customer's projection in the order service doesn't care about credit card information. By the time an order is created here, the customer has already paid, credit cards have already been used. At that point, it doesn't care about credit card information. So the projection of customer data in the order service won't contain that kind of data. And remember, my example is very simplified. There's probably 50 to 60 different fields that could be added to a, a customer table or a, you know, in the customer service, which would be the source of truth for customer information. But again, the order service won't necessarily need all 50 to 60 you know, fields uh, related to a customer. So that is also going to bear in mind our projections can be tailor-made to be as efficient as possible for the service that they're uh, required in. All right, so at this point, this is familiar, but we need some way to get the event uh, information from the customer service to the order service, and even potentially to this customer projection here. So this is where, for example, we would have a PubServe service uh, with a customer-created topic generated. Um, and this topic is responsible for receiving uh, uh, information from the customer service to then propagate to other services. So to continue the example, let's just say we have a post request has come into the customer service to add a new customer. Um, and the uh, customer service takes that information, logs a new create event inside the customer event table. And at this point, it can immediately respond with a 201 response to the uh, client to say, thank you very much. We've got it from here. Continue with what you were going to do. Nothing else has happened yet. So you can imagine that this response can actually be incredibly quick. As long as it takes to receive this data, validate it, insert it into the event table, you can then respond to the client. And that is maybe 100 to 200 milliseconds, if that. Now, once this has happened, once we've sent this response, we can then, uh, the, the customer service can then send a, publish a message into our customer created topic to tell any other interested service that a new customer was added. And that's what happens. The customer service publishes the data of this new uh, customer into the customer creator topic. It's now this PubSub topics turn to uh, go ahead and propagate this information to all related services through notifications. And this, you'll see it also comes to the customer service here. The customer's projection here can also, instead of being built internally by the customer service, it could just latch on to the customer creator topic like every other service in the system and ma manage its uh, own projection through these notifications. So this is where now the order service, for example, will receive the notification with all the customer information that was posted and only choose what it needs from that customer creator to add a new customer to this projection. Imagine as well if there was a put uh, request that came into update. We might, we might have a customer updated topic instead. A separate one may be sitting over here. And the same thing will happen. The customer service will publish the uh, data of the customer update into the customer updated topic. The order service would be subscribed to that topic, so it would receive a notification, and it would then go ahead and update the actual customer information in its projection to the current state of the customer. Pretty handy. We now have this mechanism we're using PubSub to notify services when data is changed on projections that they maintain and they can go ahead and maintain them as needed. Right, this, is, this, this also brings up the idea of, of, of a fan out system that AWS essentially, uh, I think, has coined the term. And it goes something like this. So we have our custom, customer service with this projection and event table. We're familiar with that. But now imagine if we have an order service and we have a delivery service and we have an account service and we have a shipping service and we have an invoicing service and we have another service and we have 20 other services as well along the way. The great thing that something like a PubSub gives us is we have our PubSub customer creator topic. The post request comes in just like before. Our tour response goes out because the event has been logged. 
the publish happens into the customer credit topic and immediately the notification goes out to all services that require uh, maintaining a customer projection within them. And that's the advantage now is that the PubSub uh, system is, is responsible for making sure that all these other services uh, have their data maintained correctly. One thing I haven't mentioned is that, you know, you might have a situation where, for example, maybe the delivery service goes down. Uh, it's, no, not, it's not responding to these notifications. A tool like uh, SLS, for example, I'm using a specific tool to mention this. I should probably go to the next slide. Um, just quickly, SLS stands for Simple Notification Service, and it notifies each subscribed service. But if a notification fails, it retries at least twice more. So if, for example, one of those services went down, SNS would try again. And if it still failed, it would try again. And if it still failed, well, then it gives up at that point. But nice, one nice thing is you can set up a dead letter queue to SQS. So you don't necessarily lose uh, a notification to a system if it stays down for uh, a little while. This can, you can set up an SQS queue on AWS to receive the notification data. So when that service comes back up, it can go and uh, 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 handle all the messages in the SQS uh, queue and catch itself up and then resubscribe back to the SNS topic to continue receiving notifications as if it had never gone down. And this means that you can set up the system to never lose out on information. And that's always the scariest part is, is coming out of sync. One thing to remember, uh, and just just as a, a quick um, um, indication of how big these things can scale, here, for example, you can see you can create, uh, this is the default account limits on AWS. Um, all of these values you could increase if you wanted to, but the two we're interested in here is topics and subscriptions. You can see you could have about 100,000 topics per account, which is quite a lot, and you could have about 12.5 million subscriptions per topic. Um, and AWS, if you went and asked nicely, would actually could increase these values for you. So they don't mind doing that. So some of the advantages of um, the system that we've been talking about and how it can help us. Um, so first of all, with an event log like we've been talking about, that, that event sourcing gives you, imagine how you could mine data for your business. Imagine going to your business people and telling them that you can go back to any point in time and give them the exact state of the system at that time because you no longer overwrite it. I think they would flip their lids and be absolutely and then sort of bow at your shrine. Um, this is incredibly useful data, and and it's 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 almost in, it's almost impossible to talk about how advantageous that can be for your business. You can also, uh, for example, you, we were talking about going out of sync with deleted queues. If you think of a worst case scenario, the best part is that any projection that you have at any service can immediately be rebuilt from the event log. In the originating service. So if a customer projection is, is destroyed somewhere uh, and for, for some reason you can immediately recreate that projection just by starting at uh, event log one and just replaying all your way through the entire event log and you can rebuild the customer projection for that service. It's really that simple. This also helps you create a very lowly coupled, highly abstracted system, which is one of those uh, design principles you you know you want your developers to do when building a monolith. But you know sometimes you know it's just easy to cut the corners. But yeah, you can enforce this through the actual architectural structure of your entire microservices ecosystem. Pretty pretty nice and handy. No service should be uh, no service is tightly coupled here because the communication medium between them is an asynchronous communications tool like. Uh, PubSub or SNS. So even if the customer service itself goes down, the order service still has a projection of customer data. It's not so tightly coupled to the customer service that it absolutely has to be up and maintained. Even if you bring a service down, other servicing services can continue because they already have a current state of the customer service or customer projection. There's no, there's no coupling on that. Also, as we mentioned, you get some lower latency with these client interactions because you have systems that can immediately acknowledge a request and reply back with, with uh, you know, a, a response to say, thank you, you can go on and everything happens asynchronously in the background. And it ends up being a lot easier to scale for reads and writes because imagine you, you suddenly have a spike in writes, you can now scale just the specific service that is being uh, that is receiving a lot of these um, this traffic. And if it comes down to that, you could even then just scale the specific system that is handling your event log because that's where the writes are happening. And the, the alternative for the reads as well, if a specific service is getting a lot of requests and your 
customer projection on your order service is seeing a lot of load while well, you can specifically go and scale just that specific projection to manage the load that you have very very useful and very very easy way to scale and manage these kinds of uh, events in your system so just quickly to sum things up so we can see where we've come from the ideas are to keep data separate between your microservices because this helps keep them abstracted and loosely coupled so that you don't have uh, very tight dependencies between your microservices then the idea is to log uh, the changes in state uh, through an event log instead of actually editing the state of existing uh, entities and then to uh, help uh, to assist in creating projections of uh, the entities through asynchronous communications mediums. Great, so there's a couple, there's a few resources here, and bearing in mind that, that I am South African, so there are a couple of links to South African sources, but in general, uh, you know, if you're interested in, in reading up more about building microservices, I would look for a book called Building Microservices by Sam Newman. It's kind of the go-to uh, book on the topic. The link here is to a South African e-commerce site that sells the book, a hard hardcover co a copy. But you can just look on Amazon if you're not in South Africa. Another good uh, resource, if you're interested, uh, like I am, in building serverless microservices, there is the serverless framework at serverless.com. They coined that domain pretty quickly. It's a really great framework for uh, finding ways to build microservices, especially if you're in a realm where you haven't got a very large development team or somebody that can manage infrastructure for you. Um, serverless is a great way to get microservices up and running using the serverless uh, components that exist in the AWS uh, stack. Um, it makes your life a lot easier. Event sourcing, what it is and why it's awesome. This is a really great article that kind of goes into more detail about exactly what event sourcing is, but more of the terminology, but more discussion. Uh, and it's a more generalized discussion. It's not necessarily in the microservices discussion. And then event sourcing and CQRS framework that, uh, remember I gave us at a PHP conference. So get proof is a pretty good a, a PHP uh, event sourcing and CQRS framework if you're looking for that. Again, this isn't specifically in microservices, uh, but it's still a good framework if that's something you're looking for. And that's it. Thank you so much. And if there's any questions, feel free to drop it in the uh, uh, comments down below. And yeah, um, I'm hoping pretty soon to bring my uh, workshop I did at the conference onto YouTube as well. And instead of a workshop, I'll turn that just into a demo. And that would be building microservices with the serverless framework in PHP. But thanks so much, and I look forward to your comments. Cheers.